I'm Anthony Scaramucci, and welcome to Open Book, where I talk with some of the most interesting and brilliant minds in our world today. Joining us now on Open Book is Steve Call. He wrote The Achilles Trap, among many other books, but The Achilles Trap, Saddam Hussein, the CIA, and the origins of the American invasion of Iraq. What what a it reads like a thriller, actually, Steve. I I, I really enjoyed the book. Of course, I I read your uh, I I don't know if it was your first book, but the first book that I was introduced to uh, was given to me by George Tennant, the former CIA director. I've been in Republican Party politics for many, many years, and I read Ghost Wars, which I also found fascinating. I think those, these two books are connected, although I read that book probably two decades ago. So I'm going to ask you a little bit about that book, if you don't mind. But welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Um, you know, the new evidence that you're presenting is phenomenal here. And so I want to start there, if you don't mind. Take us through the invasion and what people thought in sort of the 0203 time frame. And again, just for our viewers and listeners, this invasion took place in March of 2003, the Iraqi invasion. Um, but take us through what we thought then and what we know now. Well, we thought that Saddam Hussein uh, was a threat post 9-11 because he possessed uh, weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, biological, maybe a nuclear program, nuclear weapons program. And it turned out he didn't have any of those things. And our intelligence agencies thought he did, reported to the Bush administration that he had all of these um, weapons, was hiding them. And uh, But so uh, most of the rest of our allies thought the same thing. Even those who opposed the invasion thought he had the stuff. Uh, so it was a bit of a shock to discover that he really had destroyed it all, um, as he had claimed, uh, even though he left everyone with the impression that he was lying. And so the, my project was to try to understand what he was thinking, like, how did that happen? And as, as you referred to, I had uh, some new evidence to work with, which mostly tape recordings that he made of his own leadership conversations. He tape recorded his inner sanctum conversations as often as Richard Nixon did. And those tapes have a troubled history. We can talk about it if it's, if, if, if it's interesting, but I got a lot of them and that's what the book is about. What was he thinking? How did he create this false impression that he had WMD that he didn't have? Well, okay. So I, I mean, I, I read Ghost Wars, and obviously, unfortunately, you know, I had a short stay in the government. It was short, but I learned a lot in the government, and we get a lot wrong. Uh, we we misfire, and of course, if someone gets the opportunity to read a presidential daily brief, uh, my reaction to the brief, I was horrified by some of the threats to the United States, but secondarily, I was also, uh, it was an enlightenment to recognize that just all probabilities in the brief. You know, we don't know a lot. You know, we are guessing at things. We were guessing at the location of Osama bin Laden before we attacked that house in Pakistan. And so this new evidence that you're uncovering is also raising doubts about the truth of the accusation of the assassination of George Herbert Walker Bush, George W. Bush's father by Saddam Hussein. Okay. Uh, Sandy Berger thought the plot was faked. What do you think? <laughs> uh, I think it's not established that that the plot was real, I guess. Uh, that's a little bit of an indirect way to say it, but I think that's kind of where the evidence leaves you. It is a fascinating episode. I think, you know, your listeners might remember. Um, after the Gulf War, um, the successful war that George H.W. Bush led to expel Saddam Hussein's troops from Kuwait, which they had occupied, uh, invaded and occupied. Um, and after his presidency, uh, George, George H.W. Bush visited Kuwait to be kind of recognized and celebrated by the Kuwaiti people who were very grateful to have their country back. And he brought along uh, Jeb Bush and other members of the family. Uh, George W. was not there, but I think Laura was. And they had, you know, a big feast at the palace and he gave a talk at a university. And then after he left uh, safely on his way, nothing happened while he was in Kuwait. And then after he left, the Kuwaitis announced that they had found a car bomb that was intended to blow him up. Um, they found it in a garage someplace. 
And that led to an investigation and an allegation, very publicized allegation, that Saddam was behind this car bomb and that he had tried to kill Bush in revenge for the Kuwait war. So that uh, evidence surfaced during the Clinton administration, and there was a big review as to whether it was believable. And what we now have is a lot of evidence from the Iraqi side that basically leaves you wondering, was this really just a Kuwaiti propaganda operation? So it's interesting because uh, we have pictures uh, going back into the 80s of Donald Rumsfeld uh, meeting with Saddam Hussein. Uh, We know that we were funding uh, Saddam Hussein during the Iraqi-Iranian war. Uh, We had two interesting allies, uh, American allies. Uh, One was uh, by the name of Osama bin Laden, a very interesting American ally. We (laughs) supplied Stinger missiles to Mr. Bin Laden and his Mujahideen. Uh, We we changed the names of these people from holy warriors to terrorists, uh, depending on what they're doing and what we're thinking. Uh, But we gave him Stinger missiles, uh, helped to bring down the Soviet empire in Afghanistan. Uh, but Hussein, uh, when his neck is being cracked uh, in his execution, prior to that, the FBI interviews him and uh, he says, where's Ronald Reagan when I needed him? You remember that conversation, <laughs> yeah. uh, Steve? And so, yeah. so go into that a little bit for us. Uh, what, did, what, what was Hussein thinking? Uh, why do you think he wanted people to believe he had weapons of mass destruction when he didn't? W- what, what was the conflicts there in the relationship with uh, the Americans? Yeah, so it's the heart of the matter, what you're asking about. Um, Very briefly, the Iranian Revolution in 1979 was obviously a huge shock to the United States. And soon after it, uh, Saddam Hussein started a war with Iran, invaded them, thinking that Iran was weak because of the revolution. And he just, it was a big miscalculation. Then a terrible war ensued. It lasted through much of the 1980s. A million people died and it was basically a stalemate. But at times during that war, it looked like the Iranians were going to break through Iraqi lines and go capture Baghdad and extend their theocratic state and their revolutionary ambitions with the benefits of now owning Iraqi oil as well as Iranian oil. And the Reagan Reagan administration was desperate that Saddam not lose this war that he had started. They didn't love him, but he was a secular strong man and he was better than Ayatollah Khomeini. That was the calculation. And what they really wanted was just to make sure he didn't lose. So they opened up a CIA channel to provide him with satellite intelligence so that he could see the Iranian positions and prevent any breakthroughs. That more or less worked. Um, But it kind of left Saddam confused about whether the United States was his friend uh, or playing a double game. Because when Iran-Contra happened in the 1980s, it also turned out we were helping the Iranians during the same war. Um, And it left him uh, deeply suspicious. You know, he's not the only leader in the world who believed that the CIA was all-powerful, omniscient. And to get to your question about the WMD and why he created this false impression, one of the reasons is that he believed uh, that the CIA knows everything. And so the CIA knew that he didn't have the WMD. So when the intelligence agencies or American politicians accused him of having this, he knew that it was just a game because the CIA knew the truth and it was all just a pretense to invade and get rid of him. So why should he play the game? Why should he cooperate? Why should, because he knew what was really going on, quote unquote. The idea that the CIA could get something like that wrong, just not part of his worldview. <laughs> they're, you know, it's, they're, they're too, too powerful too good at what they do. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, there's a lot to unpack here because the American people get a certain slice of information from the news media. They get a certain slice of information from, uh, and you know, the media has a tendency to make things black and white, good versus evil. Uh, but yet there's a lot of complexity in this story. Um, and uh, I want to talk about the start of the Kuwaiti war with Iraq or the Iraqi mm. war with Kuwait. How did that war start? Okay. But some people believe that there was some diagonal drilling going on uh, by the Kuwaitis into disputed oil wells on the border that instigated Saddam's action. Is that is that a false rumor? Is that fake news, sir? Uh, I mean, there might have been um, disputable drilling like that going on. I think you have to step back and 
you know, remind ourselves that from the, you know, British colonial period of the 20th century forward, the border between Iraq and Kuwait was disputed. There were yeah. just okay, various so I, disputes about it. All right, and, so I want to interrupt you for a second, if you don't mind, because yeah. I have a lot of young viewers and listeners. Yeah. And so uh, what Steve is referring to is a treaty that was initiated in the towards the end of the, sec, the First World War. Uh, it's called the Sykes-Picot Treaty. And for those of you listening, you can Google the Sykes-Picot Treaty. Uh, and there's also a great book about this, uh, The Peace to End All Peace by David Frumkin, uh, where the British and the French are evacuating alongside of the Ottoman Empire from the Middle East. And they draw lines in the sand, effectively, <laughs> which create tribal and border disputes among all of these ancient tribes in the region. Uh, some people believe that this was done uh, maliciously. Uh, so that there would be a forever war in the Middle East after this evacuation. So what Steve is referring to, there's a there's a line in the sand. Uh, one side is Iraq, which is frankly an imaginary country. I guess these uh, bureaucrats thought, let's put the Shia, the Sunni, and the Kurds in a country. They all hate each other. We'll call it Iraq. Uh, and then they drew a line in the sand and created Kuwait. Uh, and there's always been a dispute on that border. Didn't mean to interrupt you, sir, but I think it's important to apply some context here for these listeners. And so we have this dispute. The war starts. Yeah, no, that's well done. I mean, the reason the dispute mattered after that line in the sand was drawn is that it turned out that line in the sand was sitting on one of the largest deposits in, of oil in the world, very easily accessible, easy to drill, easy to ship. So it became um, a source of real financial and economic um you know, rivalry between Iraq and Kuwait. And Iraq wanted um, the finance after the war with Iran, the country was broke. Um, and Saddam felt that he had fought the Iranians on behalf of the weaker Gulf states, including Kuwait, that they owed him. Like he had shed blood uh, to keep them safe from the Iranian revolution. And so why shouldn't they pay him back? And so the, the dispute about the border was really a dispute about billions of dollars that he felt was owed to him for having fought this war. Anyway, he decided to invade Kuwait and to take over the whole emirate. And he planned secretly in the spring of 1990, we now know, to do so. And he basically created a an information campaign to pers to, to, to fool uh, his Arab neighbors, to fool the Kuwaitis, um, to, f to fool the Egyptians and the Americans. Um, he gave the impression that he was negotiating, that maybe this was just about slant drilling, maybe he would settle for a little bit of the oil field that he didn't have already. But in fact, we now know that he planned to loot, he planned to loot Kuwait uh, all along. He had a, a you know, a, an idea of taking over the whole emirate and incorporating it into Iraq as a new province of Iraq. And that's exactly what he did on August 2nd, 1990. So this is a fascinating, very complicated story. You get into it. The book is unbelievable. Uh, it's a CIA, the origins and the invasion of Iraq, Saddam Hussein. Why do you call it the Achilles Trap, sir? I think it's a fascinating title. Why did you call it that? <laughs> uh, well, I, I like title. Did you ever watch Star Trek? You're a big fan of Star I, Trek. Yes, I am. I'm, yes. a, I'm a Trekkie as well. Yeah, I'm yeah. A, you'll, you'll find that I am way nerdier than the media gives me credit for, Carl. Okay, you'll find <laughs> yeah, okay. that about me. But yes, well, go ahead. Then, then I share that uh, with you. I love those episode titles with, you know, they were always uh, zipping around space and they'd run into some Greek god who was blocking their way or protecting a planet or they'd go down to the planet and there would be some. So I like stories that had those, that's a kind of science fiction title, The Achilles Trap. But the reason it occurred to me, besides it sort of ringing a bell from a genre of titles that I'm, a, that I find appealing, um, is that both Saddam and uh, the United States used the Achilles myth to describe their enemy uh, and to persuade themselves that their enemy was more vulnerable than it turned out uh, they, they were. Uh, so the CIA's covert operations to foment a coup against Saddam were codenamed within the CIA system, Achilles. That was the name of the operation. And then um, when I was going into these new materials from Saddam's regime, I was stunned when he started explaining 
uh, to his audience why he thought the Americans would never invade him, why they were a bit of a paper tiger, and he used the Achilles myth himself. He said every every great power has its Achilles heel. And in the case of the United States, he thought that we were so averse to casualties that we would never invade him. Um, and that the kind of pinprick strikes of the Clinton years where um, whenever he violated his, the disarmament rules or sanctions rules, we would hit him with cruise missiles um, or we enforced the no fly zone. And it was a kind of a cat and mouse game but we never put any boots on the ground. And so he had concluded from, from that containment strategy that the American people simply wouldn't put up with an invasion. And that mm -hmm. was why they had never done it before. That yeah, was our no, Achilles you, heel. You, yeah. you, you, you wonderfully uh, expose all of this in the book. I just wanted you to share that with the viewers and the listeners. Um, talk about Uday, okay? <laughs> and so I'm old enough to remember Uday and Qusay, and I think they were – part of the deck of cards of villains that the mm -hmm. Bush administration produced 20 plus years ago. Um, but this is Saddam's son who has a very troubled relationship with him. He, he's reckless and violent, but you have a new account in the book of him turning up with a rifle uh, to attempt to kill his father. Tell us about that. Yeah. I mean, I was stunned. Uh, the basic idea that Uday was dangerous and reckless and violent was understood, but this episode was not in the public domain to, uh, before. And um, it basically followed a, a, night a night party in Baghdad where Uday, um, apparently drunk, had hit Saddam's uh, beloved valet over the head with a wooden cane and inadvertently probably uh, killed him. Um, the guy fell down. Uday walked away. It turned out he had um, a brain hemorrhage and he died later. Saddam was furious. A great scene ensued between father and son. Um, I'll spare you the details, but there was a lot of shouting at the hospital. Uh, Uday grabbed a pill, a bottle of pills, um, threatened to kill himself, then grabbed a gun, uh, ran away to a, a safe house, uh, drank for two or three days, and then finally. Uh, he decided to confront his father at their sort of suburban estate, and he came out there with his AK-47 uh, loaded. And uh, whether he was still wasted or not, I don't know, but he was behaving erratically. Saddam had summoned other members of the family um, because it was a crisis, and um, his half-brother and his son, Kuse, were sitting in the living room with him when... Um, Uday turned up with this rifle at the front door and he started shooting. He shot at the feet of his brother and uh, his uncle uh, as they tried to talk him down. And then by the uncle's account, he finally sort of burst into tears and they got him to put the, the rifle down. Um, and then the more drama ensued. At one point, um, he apparently called the U.S. Embassy, Uday, and said, I'd like to defect because my father is, is uh, and, and, and Saddam said to his uh, half-brother, you know, it's really good that I, I didn't have my pistol because if I had, I would have shot him and killed him. And yeah. uh, it, Crazy. One, of the things, one of the things that's striking about it, besides just a reminder that this was a family, you know, um, uh, this was family rule and that it was a very troubled um, a coalition of powerful and violent individuals. But, um, you know, so much effort was undertaken by the United States, by Britain, by other countries to try to get close to Saddam and, and, and end his regime, uh, whether in a violent coup or some other way to get him out of office. And that, that work went on for 10 years. And it turns out the only person who really had a shot at him was his son. Yeah, it's 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 just an incredible story, and uh, I think you and I both know that the Iraqi war could have been prevented. And so, let's say uh, imaginary. I've got you in the uh, the White House uh, briefing room. You're briefing a new president, um, uh, not the two uh, elderly presidents that were being faced with this in election, but this is a, an imaginary president that probably doesn't have your depth of history. Uh, what would you say to that president about the mistakes that were made by the United States leading it? First of all, 
was that war necessary? Yes or no, your opinion. And then secondarily, uh, if you think it was unnecessary and avoidable, what were the mistakes that were made by the U.S. that would be a cautionary tale for a future president? I don't think it was necessary. I think the main mistake was to lose faith in deterrence and containment against a, an enemy who was weaker than um, he appeared. And why that mistake was made is still, you know, a um, subject of of active debate inside the United States. But I think what I was trying to do is enlarge our thinking about that error by including the Saddam side of the story. Because if you look at the world today, you know, we're trying to manage dictatorships in lots of different countries. Um, some of these characters are hard to understand. Um, you know, the leader of North Korea uh, just is easy to caricature and dismiss as a kind of cartoon figure. That's how we handled Saddam. We just sort of dismissed him as a cartoon dictator and we didn't talk to him for 12 years. So we lost contact. We lost insights into what he was doing and what he was thinking. And that I think um, is the lesson, one of the big lessons from this failure that would be relevant to that imaginary future president. Like, you know, yes, it's hard with domestic politics and it's and it can be morally troubling to have contact with an evil adversary but to just give in to you know the easy cliches of this person you know is is beyond redemption or beyond understanding that that's also a, a, a path to serious error you don't have to sanitize another person in order to try to understand them it's very, very. It's a. It, it's very well put. And the, uh, the world is way more complex than the black and white that we're often uh, taught. Uh, Saddam was working on a novel, his fourth novel, <laughs> at the time of the invasion. Yeah, this was the kind of, to me that that's the, that's the evidence that uh, for. Um, making the case that contact even with a very difficult and and, you know, disturbing adversary is um, worth it because um, you can get insights that aren't available any other way. In this case, um, we went to war thinking that Saddam was the same person he had been when he invaded Kuwait or when we fought a war with him in 1990, 1991. In fact, he was um, you know, considerably older and his interests had changed. He wasn't interested in military affairs as much as he had been. He wasn't even interested in trying to conquer the Arab world's affections as much as he had been, except through writing. And he had become obsessed with novel writing. He had written four novels in maybe five years. Um, his aides said that he was writing longhand for hours at a time that we're never quite sure whether he was up all night or spending his days doing it, but he would be passing these handwritten pages into them for typing and uh, grammatical corrections, though he didn't take edits very well. And naturally, you wouldn't want to <laughs> piss him off by telling him his, <laughs> his prose was a little long winded, which it was, in fact. Um, but uh, yeah, he was he had become more interested in his reputation as a man of letters in the Arab world and as a, a writer. Um, he had this whole system of subsidizing novelists and having them gather with him and talk about literature. Um, and none of this was really apparent at the time. Uh, he was still seen as the guy in green fatigues with the pistol strapped to his belt and and uh, forever a warrior. You know, it's it's just, it's just one of these uh, super fascinating things. Um, I I you know, and I hearken back to a op-ed that was written by George Soros. Of course, now he is a villain of the right wing. But George Soros said in November of 2001 in an op-ed in the New York Times uh, uh, to the American government, please don't overreact. It's not clear that uh, the Taliban is actually your enemy. And it's certainly not clear that uh, going to war with Saddam Hussein is going to solve or accomplish anything. And yet, of course, the Americans did overreact, as you and I both know. 
um, and uh, we've caused trillions of dollars of uh, losses uh, into the American Treasury. And obviously, the blood that was spilled was horrific. I, I had the opportunity to visit Iraq on a troop support mission in 2011. I was actually there to see Lloyd Austin, who is now our defense secretary. Mm-hmm. And we were in one of Saddam's old palaces, and uh, he made the point that we're here now. If we leave, there's going to be another – this Republican guard that we had the opportunity to pay. You and I both know this. We could have given him $100 million, and the Republican guard could have kept track of everybody. But by making that decision, Bremer and uh, Wolfowitz – Mm-hmm. And Rumsfeld making that decision not to pay them, many of them turned into the insurgency, ultimately ended up as ISIS. And so there's a lot of things that went uh, wrong here. And you write so beautifully about this. I think it's very, very important for people to know about it, which is why I appreciate you coming on. Uh, I end these podcasts with five words, sir. I'm going to read out these words and you're going to give me a one sentence, if you don't mind, reaction to these words. OK, you ready? Okay. I'm, okay. I'm, I can't promise I'll be very good at this, but I'm ready. Okay. Ready? Iraq. A state that deserves um, better neighbors. America. Uh, you know, a beacon of the greatest ideas in human history that yeah. has a lot of work to do at home. We need we need to remember that you know it's a it's a wonderful place but certainly needs uh, stronger leadership and a little bit more clarity. The CIA, that's not really not a word, but we'll use the three three letters CIA. I think one of the most fascinating institutions in post war America, misunderstood, but on a great national resource overall. Yeah, no question. I'm obviously a huge fan of the CIA, despite all the conspiracy nonsense. Osama bin Laden. Uh, A confused and violent uh, young man who um, uh, should have been stopped long before he changed the course of American history. Yeah. And we, we shot cruise missiles at him in August of 1998. People thought that was a distraction by Bill Clinton. I think we missed him by a few minutes. Uh, Saddam Hussein, sir. A product of a, you know, of a, of a country that was too divided uh, to yield s- stable leadership and who, um, you know, cause more death and suffering than any leader in the Middle East of his generation. Well, the book is fascinating, sir. It's the Achilles Trap. Uh, Saddam Hussein, the CIA and the origins of America's invasion of Iraq. New information in this book, but it's a wonderful exposition of what happened. And if you're interested in the Middle East and you're interested in America's future role and past role in the Middle East, uh, please pick up Steve's book. Uh, I really enjoyed this, sir. I hope you'll come back when you have another book to write. I know, I know that's not your last book, sir, so I hope you'll come back uh, when, you, I, when you produce another one. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed uh, talking with you, and thanks for taking the work so seriously. I really appreciate that. Mm-hmm.